All right, so if you haven't been here with us for the last couple of sessions, let me just bring you up to where we are. We have a lot to cover tonight. Uh, I wish we had more, more uh, Wednesdays, but we don't, so we have to cover the rest of chapter 12 tonight. Um, so we are in Jesus' last week on earth. Um, a couple of sessions ago, we saw that he rode in to the temple uh, in what we call the triumphal entry. And you probably know a lot about that, just being at church around Easter time. But we also learned, if you were here last time, we learned that that was a special day in the life of the Old Testament and the people of Israel. Uh, and it was called the Day of Lambs. And that was, or Lamb Selection Day, it was called. And it was the day prior to Passover that uh, people, specifically the fathers of families, would choose the lamb that would be the sacrifice for the family that they would eat during the Passover meal. And so there's lots of symbolism there. And, but that at the precise day that these fathers were choosing the lambs to be the sacrifice for the, their uh, meal there, the perfect lamb of God chosen by the father was also riding in to uh, the, the, the temple to be that ultimate sacrifice for us, the Lamb of God, that would take away the sin of the world, as, Je as John told us about that. So a little more about what happened after the people chose their lamb to help us understand what Mark is uh, covering here and the, the time between the triumphal entry and the crucifixion. It, it helps us see that the parallel of what's going on here. Now, in Exodus chapter 12, Chapter verse 3 tells us about that lamb selection day, the 10th day of the month. Each man is to take a lamb for his family, for each household. You jump down to verse 6, it says, After you've chosen your lamb, you're to take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. So on that, um, that uh, for those four days after they bring them in on the 10th day of the month, they're supposed to bring them into their household. And the point of this is that you would have time to inspect your lamb because it was very clear that this lamb was supposed to be without spot, without blemish. And so you might think it's okay when you picked it out, but you bring it into the house, you look at it for four days, it has a little cough, it has some drainage out of its eyes, or it has a lip or something like that. Well, now it's not okay for it to be the sacrifice because it has to be without blemish and so if you saw the the chart on the back there and had this from before this is the events of holy week and you see that the triumphal entry is here on the first day of the week on nissan 10 and it's also where the passover lambs are selected and this for this line right here is that time when the passover lambs were brought in to the uh, house for them to take a look at now after the perfect lamb jesus rose in, drove into the temple he then spends the next four days essentially being inspected by the pharisees and the teachers of the law as they ask him all kinds of questions and test him and try him now most of what they were trying to do was to trap him but what's happened here is the inspection of the lamb, just like in these four days you bring it into the house, and so they say, is he spotless or not? And of course, the answers he gives to all of these questions and this interaction he has with them proves that he is indeed without spot or blemish. So we have a lot to cover, like I said, but uh, so we're going to hit three things in this uh, this session, and uh, we could go very in depth with all of them, but we don't have time for all of that. But we're going to talk about marriage in heaven in verses 18 to 27, love for God and others, 28 to 34, and corruption in the temple, verses 35 to 44. And we're going to wrap up with chapter 12 at the end of tonight. So you'll remember, if you were last time, that we talked about the question about taxes that the Pharisees and teachers of the law posed to uh, Jesus. They just want a yes or no answer. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And what he does is he raises the conversation to a higher plane like he always did. And he said, you know, render Caesar what is Caesar's and then render to God what is God. So picking up from there, this is, there's no break in the timeline with this. This is just right flowing right into the next section. So, um, so the first section here is about marriage in heaven. And 
So I don't have time to read all those uh, verses here. Uh, so the Sadducees come up and, and ask him a question. Now, they don't believe in resurrection, so again, they're trying to trap him here. And so they bring up this scenario. Here's this woman. She's married. Her husband dies. She marries another. Her husband dies. Marries and husband dies. On and on and on. And then finally, the woman dies. So that's the scenario he gives them. And that question is, who is she going to be married to when they get to heaven? So uh, they think they've trapped him again, but he raises the conversation and he says, this is the answer he gives. He said, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now this verse right here causes some people a lot of, of concern. It's like, wait, you mean, you mean I'm not going to be married to my God that I've been with for decades here on earth? What, what's that about? And uh, if you're worried about, wait, I'm not going to be with my husband in eternity, let me just set your mind at ease that if your husband is a believer and you're a believer, then you're going to see him in eternity and you're going to know who he is. In fact, you're going to know, most likely, it doesn't say definitively in scripture, you're going to know everybody who's in a, as a believer. Um, and, you know, even without the introductions. You remember the story of the transfiguration that we did you know, early on in this semester? Peter, James, and John, they show up. They go up on the mountain with Jesus, and then Jesus is transfigured in front of them, and then two guys show up, and they know who they are. They know it's Elijah and Moses. Now, how did they know that? It's like he wasn't wearing a name tag, no drawings, no pictures, no videos, but they know who, uh, who these guys are. And so it's not stated categorically in Scripture, but you can extrapolate that they just knew this is a gift of God. They just had understanding of who was standing there in front of them, and some people take that as evidence in, uh, that in our glorified state that we will just know each other. And so, uh, so you can take that for what you will, but, um, you know, we, I believe we will know all other believers and, but you can uh, be sure about your husband uh, or your relationships there that you are going to know them and your relationship with that guy and everybody else will be transformed radically when we see Jesus and enter into eternity. First Corinthians 15 tells us that our physical bodies are going to be radically transformed, raised, immortal, raised, imperishable, radically, radically different from how they are now. So we can also expect a radical change in everything including how we relate to those we have known on earth and those we haven't. So now the reason Jesus tells us that there's not going to be marriage as we understand it on earth in heaven is rooted in what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5. Now we could do a whole night just on that. So just briefly, uh, we, he helps us understand the whole purpose for marriage and why it was created in the beginning. And so it is created and defined by God and is intended to stand as a visible picture between Jesus and his church. Jesus being the bridegroom and uh, the bridegroom, the husband who uh, takes care of, protects, and loves his bride, the church. The church then responds to him with respect, and submission. And devotion and all those things. So marriage as designed from its inception is intended to be basically a living parable. A signpost, if you will, pointing toward a greater reality. And that's the whole point of marriage. And that's why Jesus told us here that there won't be marriage, in a, be marriage as we think about it now in the age to come. Because when we see him face to face... The shadow that marriage is here on earth will be given way to the reality that is in heaven. So marriage will have served its purpose and then pass away. So uh, will your husband, will, you, will your relationship with your husband be a little house on the plains of glory over there where y'all just live out eternity together? Probably not. Probably not. That's probably not what it'll look like. But don't worry. Ephesians 3.20 reminds us that what he has prepared for us is beyond our imagination, okay? So we can just trust God with how that all works out and know that you're not going to be disappointed no matter what it's like when we get there. So 
That's marriage, uh, the marriage in heaven. This will lead to point number two, which is love for God and love for others. But we'll spend a little bit more time here. And so, so this guy, he's been listening to all of this interaction that Jesus had with the Pharisees. And he's very intrigued by what Jesus says. So in verse 28, he said, he noticed that Jesus had given them good answers. And he said, he has a question of his own. And he's like, okay, so of all the commandments, which is the most important and in his in his reply jesus replies with and summarizes the whole of the law now we'll look at these things um in detail but the first part of what jesus answers here is from deuteronomy chapter six and it's called the great shema and if you've ever been around you know uh or learned anything about jews even today the great shema it has the, that word shema just means to hear that's what, but it, in uh, Deuteronomy 6, it's here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's what they would say. Every devout Jew would wake up in the morning. They say this line, and the last thing they, before they go to bed, they say this line, affirming out loud to uh, themselves and their families there that there is one God. There is no other. He has no rivals. Uh, he is one in essence, one in existence, and he alone is the only God. Very powerful statement. And then he quotes it back in Mark, the, in verse 5 there, he kind of uh, quotes this. He says, love your Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. So uh, I made this little slide for you um, to look at when some time to talk about this. We don't have time to look up all the verses, but this is really how he breaks this down. And I'll go through this quickly but in here he says our heart he would love god with all of our heart now the heart is the core of your being that's the way the bible talks about it it's where your emotions are it's where your desires are where your motivations are and where your affections reside and so that's the the uh, heart the soul now you can we have a debate later about whether soul and spirit are the same or they're inter they're two different things we can talk about that later but the soul in this instance is that immaterial part of you the spiritual part of you that relates to god it yearns it stretches out for him it desires him and as the psalm says david wrote yearns for the my soul pants for you the living god so that's the soul then he says you love the God with your mind. Now, that's the decision-making part of you, the thinking part of you, and it's the part that does math, double the recipe, or it remembers your best friend's birthday or how to get to the grocery store, and it makes all the rational decisions and choices that you need to do to get through uh, your day. And then last, strength is ability, any kind of ability or power. Now, this part of you is a part... The physical part puts away the groceries and it picks up toys off the floor and it plays pickleball on the sat a Saturday afternoon. And it's the, but it's not just sinews and muscles and skin. It's also the part of you that's on the inside that helps you get through difficult times. It's like you, and so strength is simply any kind of ability, whether spiritual, emotional, or, or, or physical, that you need to draw on to get tasks done. So Jesus is really telling us here that what we need to do is to love God with all that we are. He needs to be first in our desires, first in our longings, first in our ability, first in our decision making, first really in everything. And that's what Jesus is telling us it means to love God. But the answer that uh, uh, Jesus gave to the scribe didn't stop there. He went on to say, the second commandment is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is a quote from the Old Testament too, Leviticus 19.18. And I just as a side, if you need a reason to read Leviticus, Jesus did. So don't skip over that one when you're reading. <laughs> but the point here is that Jesus gives us a standard by which we're to love others. Now, notice first that it is completely different from how we love God, right? We love him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that necessarily will translate into obeying him and following his 
commands. Just like it says in John 14, 23, when Jesus says, if you love me, do what? Obey me, right? And so you can't really love God and not do what he says. Yeah. I need to follow through with, you say this, you know, like Peter did, right? You know, because you say, Lord, then I'll do what you ask. That's what needs to be our attitude. Attitude, and we won't obey him, then we're just giving him lip service, just like the Pharisees did. But Jesus doesn't say we're to love others by obeying them, right? Never says there's no scripture that tells us to obey other people outside of obeying your parents, right? When you're a kid. But other people don't get our heart, soul, mind, and strength. They don't. They aren't made to handle that and, or to give it, by the way. And so it's impossible. So all the love songs and poetry and all that swarmy stuff that you hear about that, that you're my everything and the whole world revolves around you, um, it's a recipe for disaster. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Others aren't built to do that or in turn be that for us, right? So if you're focusing all your energy on someone else with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to draw out of them everything that you need, you're going to be disappointed. You are going to be way disappointed because they are not designed to be the end goal pursuit of anything. They're to be our companions, our fellow workers, friends, all of those kinds of things. And they're very important because we're built for community, but they are not to be the be all and end all of anything. And so when people go into relationships or marriages, Asking somebody like, you know, Jeremy Guar, you complete me. <laughs> We're asking them to do something that they cannot do, right? The way, that kind of way, put on a relationship or another person to, will crack that relationship and many times crumble it into dust. That kind of affection is meant and reserved for God alone. So the standard for loving others is as yourself. Right now, love is a verb here, and it necessarily translates into action. It's not about emotions and feelings and all that kind of Western idea about what we think about love here is. is but what it generally means is to have benevolence toward and to take regard for their welfare. Okay, that's what the love here is meaning. And so when we talk about loving others as we love ourselves, it really implies, again, not emotions, which can be good or bad, either toward ourselves or toward other people, but it, it means taking action toward them as we would take action toward our own welfare. Turns out we're really pretty good at that already, right? I mean, like we look out for our own welfare pretty much all the time. I mean, like when you pack a lunch for, for work the next day so you won't be hungry or you uh, go to bed and you look uh, out on your uh, weather app to see if you need a sweater tomorrow or an umbrella, you're taking care of your welfare or you go, oh, I got to get up early in the morning so I'm going to go to bed on time. That's all looking after ourselves. And I mean, uh, so those kinds of things are expressing love toward ourselves, even when our feelings about ourselves will come and go. I mean, let an emergency situation happen and you, know, you feel threatened or you feel afraid and you will see just how quickly you respond to take care of yourself, right? You suddenly become the number one priority, right? So basically, when we serve our own needs, not in that twisted kind of bad way that we a lot of talk about a lot of times in the church, but in a general caretaking kind of way, um, that is love. And it's a, a general guideline for how we begin to show love for other people. And so we need to note also that these are two commands that are wholly intertwined and they are in the right order. We can't flip them over that we have to have love for God first and then love for others second. So the first commandment to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength is the necessary foundation for that second love that we have that goes outward. And uh, so the second command there is the natural response, the natural overflow when the first one is right. So when we orient ourselves up, it's much easier to then flow out toward other people. So we really can't do the second without the first in the right order. So um, because what really transforms that destructive kind of 
focused on ourselves, that we all kind of lean toward that selfish me first sort of stuff, is a wholehearted love for God. That's transformed because once that's the way we orient ourselves up, then it no longer becomes as threatening to, to give away to other people, right? So I'm drawing on what God gives me with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. My affections are all on Him. So when I'm asked to, to give my time, my energy, my uh, attention, my finances, my material resources, whatever it is to people out there, it's much easier because I'm not empty and, and feel like they're, you're taking something from me. And so, uh, but all that attention and thought that we give to ourselves is properly directed toward God. It transforms everything about us right down to the very core of our being. And so we can give away and give away and serve and serve and we don't end up with less. We end up being full because we receive from God first. So uh, to give you an example of what it kind of looks like for us to serve God, I'm going to give you an illustration from our lives. So uh, this is my dog Tucker. Um, he is a little rescue we got last summer. He is about 10 pounds, a little bitty guy. And so we got him, um, he was rescued from a hoarding household. So he was not taken care of. He um, was uh, afraid. And so we think people were mean to him just because the way he interacts with people. And so we, uh, this, so uh, Tucker here, he was afraid of us to begin with and kind of still is. Now I've been around dogs a long time. I've had dogs all my life since I, before I was born. My parents had dogs, so I rarely had a time in my life when I only had one dog. And so, but I have never been around a dog that has been so afraid as he is. He just runs from us, and um, he's he's uh, hard to get through to. <laughs> Let's put it like that. You can ask Leah; she'll tell you. <laughs> we we struggle with him now. About two or three months into our having him, he did attach to Cliff. And he loves Cliff. And he jumps up in his lap, lap and, um, but I can't reach down and pet him still even to this day. He reached down and he runs. You can't call him or look at him and he runs. And um, he won't take food from me. He'll weird out sometimes and he just, I'll put his bowl, you know, slide the bowl across the floor to him. It's, he's just so afraid. And uh, it's, it was really, well, still is, really bothersome kind of for me. I mean, I'm the crazy dog lady, right? I love the dogs. I do all the stuff with the dogs. And uh, it's been really hard. It's been really hard with this one right here. I mean, he's all the work of a new puppy and a dog in the house, and training and everything like that, but none of the reward. He doesn't get cuddles, no snuggles, no jumping, greeting you when you come in the house. And it makes me kind of sad. I mean, because I'm like, I want to get to this dog. I want to, get to help him because I know he's just, his past trauma is what's causing this. And so coincidentally, coincidentally, we got him about the time I was writing this lesson and I was working on how to explain what it looks like to love other people. And it dawned on me, this little guy is a picture of that. Here I am doing all these things for him, making sure he's safe and loved and, you know, I take him to the bed and he wants nothing to do with me. Absolutely nothing to do with me. And he is only afraid of me and rejects every bevy love that I want to just pour on this dog. Right? I mean, I want to just say, little buddy, you know, if you just could get over this, you would have all the love that you could possibly have. But it's not about me. It's not about me. He didn't know me. He came like that, and it's the past trauma that he had that caused him to be afraid. He's just hurt. He's just hurt. And um, so, you know, when, but because I'm not getting what I want from a, having a dog in the house, doesn't mean I still don't stop taking care of him, right? I still feed him. I still get up with him when he's in the middle of the night. I still make sure he has a nice warm bed. I do all of those things. I mean, it's not Cliff that does this. I mean, I'm like, can you feed the dogs one time? He's like, oh, what, 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 do, what do you feed him? <laughs> he doesn't know what he's doing. So I'm the one that takes care of this dog. And um, so, you know, I just still don't get any snuggles, no loving, no nothing. He doesn't gravitate toward me at all. But that's the way we're supposed to be when we deal with other people, right? Because it's really easy to love people when they love us back. Really easy. 
But the love that God followers are supposed to have must be deeper and continue even when we get nothing back. Right? Because if we only love people when they give us what we need, who is the most important person there? It's me, right? Because I'm focusing on how you respond to me rather than what I'm focusing on you. And so, <laughs> isn't, but isn't that kind of how we act? I mean, I'll serve you and I'll love on you and do things that you need, but if you're unresponsive or if you ignore me or if you're not grateful enough, then uh, let alone if somebody out and out rejects you, right? I mean, then my response of love stops, right? That's kind of how we are. We're like, okay, as long as you're doing it the way I want you to, respond the way I want you to, then I'm going to keep serving you. And we can reason in our minds and say, God doesn't expect me to keep serving them when they don't love me back, right? I mean, when we get that, right? Love our neighbors and our enemies as we love ourselves. And so we have to have that, all of that kind of selfless love, once again, we have to orient ourselves upward toward God. Because we will run out if we try to do it in our own energy. So we have to draw on God and able to do this kind of selfless love that continues to give and give and give even when we get nothing back. And so, you know, as we do orient toward God, he is an overwhelm, overflowing deep well. You're not going to ever draw a drive when you go to God. I mean, you are going to be able to give away when you draw on him first. You know, Jesus said, he says, whoever believes in me, streams of living water will flow from within him. So you cannot exhaust what God gives. So realigning our energies and affection towards God makes loving others the natural overflow, the natural response of one that, and you are fulfilled and filled up instead of empty by trying to serve other people. Okay? So that's love for God, love for others. And so Jesus finishes up this interaction with this man uh, who came, brought this question here. And we don't have time really to talk about that. But if you just look at verse 34, this is like a, a funny little thing on the end there that Mark puts. It's like, we then no one dared ask him any more questions. No, no joke, right? I'm like, like oh, not going to bring any more questions because he's turned it all around. It, uh, again. And so that moves us from this section into the last section, which is the, about the corruption in the temple. So in this section, the other people are not asking him any more questions. So Jesus starts by asking his questions. Now, this is what he says here in verses 35 to 37. There's some really good Old Testament stuff here that we once again don't have time to go through. So I had to cut, cut, cut. So uh, I'm just going to summarize kind of what he's talking about here. Uh, but the general point is kind of that he's focusing their thoughts and helping himself, helping the people who are listening kind of come around and understand the identity who, who Messiah really is. And they, the large crowds, listened to him with delight. They loved to hear what he had to say because it was so different from everything else that they had heard the Pharisees and the Sadducees say. say. So, um, but then he comes right after this, this scathing denunciation of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Now, this is all connected to what came before and goes all the way through chapter 13. This is one big, long discourse, and there's really not any break as far as time goes. And so all of this is really in the same afternoon, so you really can't separate these pieces here. But what he does is he, he, he starts talking to them. And so the scribes and the teachers of the law knew what the law said. They studied it. That's what their whole job was. And they considered themselves to be the gatekeepers of the law. We talked about this last semester a little bit. They were experts. They could quote verses and they could tell people how to live so they didn't violate it. And their interpretation, as far as the people go, and as far as they considered, was equal to the law of God, or so they thought. And, but Jesus does not mince words here. He is clear on the dangers of false teaching uh, and people who say they speak for God but really pervert 
his truth. So he says, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and greeted in marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Now notice the um, reference there in verse 40 to the widows' houses. And this is the salient point for understanding the story that's coming next about the widow with the two copper coins. Heard it called the widow's mite, maybe, uh, from the King James. But this is, this is another nameless person from the Bible. And if you've been here with us all along, you know I like to give nameless people in the Gospels names. And so I call this girl Penny. You know, two copper coins, her name's Penny. <laughs> so it's crucial to see, to understand what's going on with Penny, to understand this part. We don't just jump to, you know, if you look in your Bible, there's got a different heading, so it looks like it's separated, but it's all together. And so he, what he does is, now he, he is typically, when you see this, when you hear that talked about, about Penny here, she, you, people hold her up as someone to emulate or pattern but in context, that is not Jesus' point. So let's kind of go through this and try to get a, bring ourselves around what he's trying to say, really. So we said several times that the Israelites, the whole focus of their culture was around the temple. And often, at the very end of their lives, what would happen would be is they would choose to leave all or a significant part of their money uh, to the temple as a kind of a final gift, kind of like we do in estate planning. People do that today. They you leave part of your estate to a church or a parachurch organization. That's kind of what they did back then too. So, But here is where it really got sticky. See, the scribes were the ones who people went to to make out a will. That's what scribes did. They made legal documents and made sure it was in line with the law of God. And so, in, but at the end, of all of this, the money that came to the temple trickled down to them. Okay? So you can see how that you would see that 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 since they were beneficiaries of this money down the road, you can see how corruption would get into the system pretty fast. And that was especially true when it came to widows because uh, now there's a double-edged sword kind of thing here because the law said very, very, very clearly that that the people in Israel were supposed to take care of the widows. And here's uh, just three of some of the, the Old Testament references, and there are a lot, about what they were supposed to do. They were cursed if they withhold justice from the widow. And when you're harvesting your fields or beating your, your olive trees, you're supposed to leave some to take care of these widows. And Exodus 22 says, don't take advantage of widows. So all these, these uh, commands that they were supposed to take care of. Now, they knew this. They studied this. But what they thought was that specifically when it came to widows is that they were under the judgment of God. Uh, that is, they were sinful in some way because here God took away your husband. And if you hadn't had them been doing whatever that was hidden in your life, then God wouldn't have taken your husband away from you. That was the mindset. And so... They didn't have any problem aiding God in punishing these widows for their hidden sins. And that was in direct contradiction to what these verses and many other like them said. And because, so now because the widows did not have a man to help them uh, in these decisions, and in that day they had no recourse in the justice system. They couldn't go to court. They couldn't even come into court. So what they did was when they wanted to to uh, get some advice about how to manage th things in their household especially, they would turn to these holy men, these scribes, and they trusted them implicitly. So like Jesus said, what they would kind of do is come into the houses and they'd wave their arms and make these big sounding prayers and they would say all this, this holy sounding stuff and they would convince these widows that they were on their side and taking care of them when what they were really doing was swindling them out of their money and getting them to sign documents and legal pa papers that were not in their best interest. So, and, and with all with the attitude of, well, they're just getting what they deserve. We're just helping God out here. So Mark's account of this moment right here 
uh, when he just brings down this condemnation on these people, is a condensed version of the whole speech that he delivers in Matthew 23. Now, we don't have time to read that, but that's where Jesus gives the seven woes, where he calls them whitewashed tombs and blind guides and serpents and murderers and sons of hell. It's really the most scathing, strong statements that Jesus makes about anything in that passage, and it's directed toward these people who perverted the law of God. And at the end of this, he does say in Matthew 23, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Look, your house has left you desolate. And so he, uh, you can feel Jesus' anguish here. You can feel his soul, his heart hurting, desiring to protect these little ones who are less fortunate and being taken uh, advantage of. And he's aching in his soul over the state of the temple and specifically about the leaders. And at the end of this denunciation of corruption and all that's going on, this hypocrisy of all these uh, leaders here, uh, he uh, sits down. Back in Mark, he sat down. And so he's watching here. He's, he sat down after all of this, and his heart's just broken here. And he's watching people coming and going, giving uh, in the temple. And he sees the rich putting in large uh, amounts of money, lots of fanfare, and then he sees Penny, who's the real-life illustration of what he just said in verse 40. One who has had her life devoured by the system. And then he says, calling his disciples to him. Now, this is important, uh, that phrase right there, because he notices Penny, and then he points her out. It's as, it's as if he's saying to his disciples, come here, come here, hey, there's one that I was talking about. Look at her. And then he says, I'll tell you the truth. This poor widow has put in more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but, out, but she gave out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Now, Jesus is not necessarily making a, a, an example of what to do. He doesn't say this is a worthy spiritual act that greatly pleased him. He doesn't say go and do likewise like he sometimes does when he sees people uh, express great faith. What he does say is the religious system has been preying on widows, and she is an example of them. The system that she had trusted ended up costing her more than everybody else. She put in relatively more than everybody else because she all, that's all she had to live on. And this is why context is crucial in understanding this, is because while she follows so closely on the denunciation of the scribes uh, condemning the, uh, the scribes' practice of devouring the widows' houses, we're to assume that she represents the results of it, the wreckage left behind by what these guys were doing. And Penny's impoverished condition right here should have alone been a scandal in Israel in light of what the law of Moses has said, right? It commands taking special care of widows, but the teachers in Israel were supposed to be the ones who were guardians of the temple and caretakers of the law and representatives of God himself. They should have come around her and taken care of her and it ne she had never, she had never got to the place where she, all she had was two copper coins anyway. So the religious system has failed her. She is a victim of this established religious system that he condemned. That is the point that he's making here. She has given her last coins, everything that she has to a system that should have been given to her and taken care of her, but it took from her. And Jesus had to have his heart broken here for her, for all the other women like her. And uh, he is also righteously angry at those who took advantage of her. And as a result, judgment is coming really quickly. Now, Mark puts the story of Penny between this denunciation and the next thing we're going to talk about next week is chapter 13, where he talks about how the temple is going to be destroyed and torn 
down. So judgment is coming. They, this links what he said before to what's coming next. And that prophecy of the destruction of the temple is right on his heels with no break in it. And so for, there's really no remedy except the remedy he's going to bring through his blood sacrifice in just a few days. So uh, what's the takeaway for all this today? Right, just a lot of history and that kind of stuff. Uh, now, we like to throw rocks, the Pharisees, and they deserve it a lot of times. They're doing some really bad stuff. But what I want us to remember is that this is a, they are a warning to us because the temptation toward corruption is universal, right? It's easy to think about corruption as being out there and somebody else doing it, the government and you know all that kind of stuff and politics full of corruption. And we can point our fingers and see it really easily. But you know what? Corruption happens very much closer to home as well. Our way of thinking can easily be corrupted by our own personal desires, by our wants, by our needs, and our estimation of how things should be, right? And the leaders in Israel made a lot of assumptions and propagated systems out there that made it easy for them to excuse the actions and attitudes. All the while, they pasted the veneer of holiness, righteousness over the top of it. But we have the, are capable of the same thing. And we have the profound ability to justify just about anything we want to do. Literally anything. I mean, you've heard crazy stories about people who've been in church for their whole lives, and you're like, what? <laughs> I mean, you've heard that. And I mean, if, if we are given enough time, enough desire, we can find ourselves excusing all kinds of things that are in direct violation of the scriptures. We can't. And you hear people say all kinds of crazy stuff, but you know we don't need to point fingers out there. We need to also always talk about ourselves. You know, uh, because anything in direct violation of scripture is a problem. We, we don't need to give ourselves a pass on those things. We need to be not looking outside and say all that, all those people over there, but asking ourselves some hard questions. What about my own behavior? What about my own attitudes? What about the things that I go, yeah, well, that's not a big deal. This is why the word of God must be supreme in our lives. It must govern our behavior, our desires, all the way down into our thoughts. Because allowing your mind to rest on scenarios that are in direct violation to scripture is not okay, and it is not okay. Harmless, because, because where our mind goes, our feet will eventually follow. So we must be careful to monitor our thoughts, because you can allow all kinds of things to become a reality in your life with wrong thinking. This is our first defense. We have to renew our minds according to the truth. This is what these two scriptures tell us. Romans 12, 2, you know it. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is the way you discover what God's will is. Philippians 4, 8, very practical stuff. We like to put this on coffee cups, as the pastor, I like to say, uh, and he listen to says all the time. We put it up on placards. But it's, when you put it in your life in a very practical way, it makes a lot of difference. Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy, think about such things. If you've never tried this, you need to. It's like, what is true? Start with that. Is what I'm thinking on, is it true? Well, if it doesn't make it past the first filter, we need to think about something else. We need to put our minds on other things and go right down the line. What is noble? What is right? What is pure? What is lovely? And let, and Connie always says that, that lovely is a high bar. Because we can find things that are true, right, noble, and it's not lovely. It needs to go. Right? So use this as a filter through what you are thinking. And if it's not right, put on some praise music. <laughs> Think about something else. But don't allow your mind to just dwell in that stuff. Especially it's like, well, she can't do that. 
he can't do that. And you know, I'm not going to say it, but if I did say it, this is what I'd say. <laughs> right? And you have your mind all down into the wrong things. And so when somebody does say something, you're cocked and ready to go. Right? So use these things as a filter for your mind. And so when something pushes on you a little bit, and uh, we have to reevaluate ourselves in light of what does the Word of God actually say. And, and that's what all these questions that the Pharisees and the activities of, uh, that they were doing was all about. They didn't like Jesus messing with the way things work. They didn't like to have their control tested. They didn't like their power bases disturbed. And they didn't want him pushing on their traditions and their practices. And the scary part of that is that they knew the law. They knew it frontwards and backwards and inside and out. And they had become... Uh, they had learned to value the things that they liked more than the actual law of God. And that's very easy for us to do, too. Uh, if we don't know what the law of God says and what the Word of God says, our opinions can be easily led to a place of comfort, a place of what we like, and we allow those things to supersede what the Word of God says. And you end up where we are today in the church with a very disturbing trend of churches that calls itself Christian but denies that Jesus was sinless, says Jesus wasn't God, and that original sin wasn't even a thing. That's probably not where you are, uh, but we have to realize that those things and those people begin very subtly with questioning things that are actually written in the Word of God. Yeah, yeah, that's not a big deal. It is a big deal. If it's written in scripture, it's a big deal. We need to raise our uh, 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 willingness to follow that to whatever he says. But, so, but when you allow yourself to become the judge of God's word, rather than it judging you, you are on a slippery slope. And it is very difficult to get off, uh, off of. Now remember, Satan is really patient. He is really patient. He will wait 40 years to get you away from God one little step at a time. He doesn't care how long it takes. It doesn't take care what you end up worshiping, whether it be a, a false religious system or worshiping yourself. He doesn't care as long as you're not worshiping Christ himself. So to wrap this all up, we have to be vigilant. And govern ourselves by the word of God always. Be consistently and constantly in these truths and allowing them to judge us no matter what he has to say about us. Remember, we don't stand in judgment over his word. <laughs> it stands in judgment over us. Now, we can have healthy discussions about uh, meaning and application, but we allow his word to speak to us and judge the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. As we orient uh, ourselves in a wholehearted love for God, we orient ourselves upward, and the natural response then will be to yield our will, surrender to what he, ever, what he says, love others as he loves us, and choose to obey no matter what he requires. Amen? God, we just thank you for the the sharp sword of your word, that it will correct us, and it will encourage us, and it will comfort us, and it will guide us. God, let us not neglect your precious word to us, because we'll end up far away from you. And God, uh, use the Holy Spirit to encourage us, to warn us when we're off the path, so that we will not uh, betray the word of God or the Son of God. And it's his powerful name we pray. Amen.